friends, thanks so much for joining me today. I hope you all are having a wonderful day. Ah, it's so good to be here. I'm excited to film this video. I appreciate you being here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is M, and you're watching Makeup Brie. By the way, if you are new here, thank you again for being here. I appreciate you. I hope you like what you see today. If you do like what you see and you want to come back and hang out again with me in the future, please be sure to click that subscribe button, ring that bell, and uh, yeah. So in this video, I thought it'd be kind of fun to talk about ColourPop and what makes ColourPop so unique. How did it get so poppin'? <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I'm not that punny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm excited for this video because I get to talk a little nerdy with you. I get to go a little bit into business and strategy and some things that I don't generally talk about on this channel. A little bit about my background. I've been a consultant in business and marketing and strategy entrepreneurship for over 10 years and I have such a a passion and love for everything business like what makes a business successful what makes it fail what are some ways that a business can have competitive advantage over their competitors what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses what are some ways that a company can be unique in an oversaturated space or oversaturated market I thought it'd be kind of fun to kind of look at color pop through a lens of business strategy they're wildly successful how do they do it how like, you don't see a business this young have this amount of success that quickly. So how did that work? So if that sounds interesting to you, please stay tuned. Let's get into it. So I thought it would be kind of fun to do this business talk while also doing my makeup. And I thought about this a minute ago where I realized I don't have any ColourPop makeup to wear in this video. Part of that is because I'm doing a project empty, shop my stash kind of thing where I have five products I'm focusing on using over the over 30 days. Two of the products are kind of unique in their color tone so it makes it hard for me to find products that mesh well with them that won't make me feel like a clown at the end of the day. And the very few ColourPop products that I do have don't quite fit that tone family so that's why just wanted to make that a note because I'm sure someone would call me out for the irony of talking about ColourPop yet not using ColourPop. Yes, I know. All right, so ColourPop is a business that was founded in 2014 and it was founded by another brand called Seed Beauty. Seed Beauty is an incubator brand. It is an incubator business in that it is kind of a parent company. It houses multiple brands under its name. ColourPop is only one out of a handful of brands that operates from Seed Beauty. Seed Beauty also represents 4-3 Beauty, Soul Body, Kylie Cosmetics, KKW Beauty, Tati Beauty. Quick edit here. As of editing this video, Seed Beauty has removed KKW Beauty, Kylie Cosmetics, and Tati Beauty from their website. Speculating, speculating, speculating. What makes them unique in this space is that they don't own the trademarks to all of those businesses. So Tati Beauty, for example, that trademark was owned by Tati Cosmetics, which is obviously owned by Tati Westbrook and her husband James Westbrook. Their business, uh, Tati Cosmetics Inc., owns that trademark, which also implies that they own more rights to how that business operates. It's not necessarily owned by Steve Beauty. I don't know what the inner workings of those contracts are, but I just wanted to make that known that Seed Beauty doesn't own everything, that there's probably licensing agreements and things in there for the use of their names, the product, etc. So Seed Beauty has a portfolio of product lines. ColourPop is probably one of the most popular ones, and it's the oldest one, having been formed in 2014. I'm going to focus a lot of this video more on Seed Beauty as a whole. Talking about ColourPop specifically isn't going to make sense when ColourPop is exclusively owned by Seed Beauty. So, who is Seed Beauty? Seed Beauty LLC, Limited Liability Company, was filed in California under the Secretary of State as of March 19th, 2014. So in March, it'll be a whole seven years old. Yay, happy birthday, ColourPop. Happy birthday, Seed Beauty. Seed Beauty was founded by a brother and sister duo, John and Laura Nelson. So John and Nora, Nel Nora, 
wow, wrong name, John and Laura Nelson have extensive backgrounds in business. Um, Laura had recently come from managing and overseeing all the operations for Spatz Labs. We'll come back to that in a second. And John had been the CEO of, um, John had earned his MBA and Laura had been working in business and, you know, doing all the businessy things in corporate America with Nordstrom, et cetera, et cetera. And then she moved on to Spatz. So what's interesting about Spatz Labs is that it is the laboratory that ColourPop and Tati and KKW and Kylie and all of them use for their makeup lines. And I'm assuming that is part of their brand deal with Seed Beauty. And there is consistency in having the same lab produce everything and it is obviously California based. What's interesting about Spatz Labs and this is, there's not a lot of information about them online. Um, they don't have a website as far as I could find. They are a privately held company, so they're not re required to report things publicly outside of, you know, normal tax filings and such. But they don't have to report things like, um, like Microsoft or Amazon or any of those because those companies are publicly owned. In other words, they sell their stock on the, an open market where people can buy ownership of a company. That's not the case for Seed Beauty. It's not the case for Spats. However, Laura and John Nelson's parents, I believe, are the ones who founded Spats Laboratories. Now, I did a little bit of research on Spats, and what I was able to find was that there are two filings under the name Spats Laboratories and Spats Labs. So the original one is the Spats Corporation. The Spats Corporation, Inc., so it's an incorporated business in the state of California, that was filed with the Secretary of State on February 20th, 1956. It's seasoned, it's like our, well in my case it'd be a parent because my mom was born in 1955, but for some of you younger folks that would be like your grandparents. Yes, I'm old. But they started in 1954 and had then two years later filed everything legitimately with the California Secretary of State in 1956. I believe that's the same Spatz Labs that is associated with ColourPop and Seed Beauty. There is another filing with the California Secretary of State called Spatz Laboratories, which is basically the same name of the Spatz Corporation, only a different entity altogether because the state of California doesn't recognize them as being the same thing because they're different filings, different everything. What I thought was interesting on this was that that particular company had been registered on September 14th, 1973. And that was also launched in Venice, California, which is in the LA area, which is of course where Seed Beauty, ColourPop, all of them are. They're in Oxnard, California. So Venice is not far away from there. So I thought that was interesting that they had a suspended, um, that their company was suspended. My guess is that maybe they were trying to rebrand or they were doing something different and it just didn't go the way they had intended. So they, Kind of abandoned ship. I don't know what happened there. I just figure, meh, it's not that important. Um, what is important is that Spatz Laboratories is next door to the Seed Beauty. They're like right across the street from each other, basically. It's kind of cool. Very convenient for a brand. So Seed Beauty was founded by the brother and sister duo John and Laura Nelson. And, you know, they have a lot of business experience. Laura had been managing and overseeing spats. So it only made sense for them to, you know, venture into the cosmetic space. And instead of, you know, using their laboratory for third-party brands, why not break into it from another standpoint? Why not get more of the pie? Like, they don't need to just produce the products. Let's sell them, too. Let's, let's brand it under our own, and let's make more money that way. So that's what they did. And that was in 2014. I keep saying that because in the business world, it's remarkable that they've had this amount of success within seven years. So ColourPop became an internet sensation starting in 2014. Now, I think the reason why they were so successful is because beauty space on YouTube and online was just growing immensely. We all have seen that, we've all heard it, we all have experienced it. So basically Seed Beauty came into fruition at a time at the perfect time. It was the perfect storm because people were really interested in beauty. 
Uh, you have younger audiences who are flocking to the internet to learn how to use beauty and there's no other way to really reach a young audience unless you're online and in the cosmetics industry, especially with how old a lot of those businesses are, most of them focus on people who have the money to spend on makeup. They don't necessarily focus a lot on younger audiences. You see a lot of drugstore brands like CoverGirl, maybe even Revlon and Maybelline doing ads. But you've noticed that over the past few years, like everything has been shifting to online. But you also notice how some of these luxury department store brands such as Estee Lauder or Lancome, Clinique, Origins, Philosophy, all of those brands don't necessarily do a lot of commercials or ads in a younger audience space. The cosmetics industry is more than just this youth perception we see on YouTube. There's a huge market for beauty outside of the online space which encapsulates bigger demographics. So you get older audiences. But ColourPop decided to focus more on this younger digital millennial Generation Z audience, which was very smart because they were able to harness the power of the internet and internet marketing to grow their brand. So they, you know, had a large presence on Instagram and because uh, Instagram is basically where a lot of businesses, these indie brands, have really come into their own and gotten a lot of attention, have grown their businesses. We see even larger brands now trying to go back and you know, recoup and <laughs> try to, you know, catch up to this digital space that they're missing out on. We see that a lot with brands that are traditionally worn by older women. I say that with love. I don't mean it like they're old. It's just these luxury department store brands tend to focus on the demographics that are more able to spend money. Now it's millennials. Millennials have the highest earning power. These demographic generations are moving so fast. Like there was the MySpace age, then the Facebook age, then there's Twitter, which kind of worked in tandem, and then you had Instagram, and then now you've got TikTok. And then I'm sure in a couple of years we'll see something else that will just kind of take over. So it's just interesting that they chose to move into a digital space. And as such, they have grown significantly. So despite ColourPop having this really large presence in the digital beauty space, only 5.37% of their website traffic, so traffic to ColourPop.com, was referred by social media, which means that people were either organically coming across their site, like, oh, I'm just going to type in ColourPop.com, or they may have and decided to Google search them. Might have been banner ads. It could be a number of things. So about 35% of their traffic comes from YouTube. So about a little over a third of their traffic, which is huge. Over 99% of their website traffic is organic, which means that people just found them organically. They weren't referred by paid link. That's not the source of a lot of their website traffic. It's organic, meaning people just naturally go to it. That could be through social media. That could be through whatever. But it's kind of unique that they don't actually have to spend that much of their marketing budget towards these campaigns and your traditional internet marketing ads that you see on websites. Back in the day, like Blogger and Blogspot, you would see these ads on the side and that's how people made some revenue is by having those banner ads. But with ColourPop, it's not something that they focus all their attention on. Instead, they focus more on social media. With them having focused on social media like Instagram, Instagram rewarded them for their diligence and posting regularly and getting engagement on their posts by having likes and comments and follows and they continued that cycle with posting new images. They of course worked with the creators in promoting different images. One thing that they can do for free, which you'll see a lot of in any online marketing space now, is how so many people love to be recognized by a brand. You use, for example, a ColourPop eyeshadow and you have this aesthetically pleasing picture they'll repost it and tag you in it. So ColourPop was a brand that really, in my opinion, was kind of the granddaddy of doing that. They grew a lot of loyalty because they promoted, you know, small creators on 
on their socials and they harness the power of networking on social media and they do something called webbing which is where they link back to all of their sites through their social media handles so ColourPop, ColourPop, ColourPop they all are in inextricably linked and they all go to their website which is what you want to do if you're trying to you know manage a business so all of the traffic should be directed there makes sense they also grew more popular as they started to collaborate with larger brands they had a lot of disney collections hello kitty um they recently did star wars with i forgot the name of baby yoda <laughs> Um, they did Candyland. They just launched the Animal Crossing one. Like they have some really fun collaborations and people look forward, even if they don't necessarily like them, they do look forward to those collaborations to kind of see what's coming next. So they've done a really good job getting people excited about what's coming. And of course, we all know ColourPop in that they produce a lot of product. They're notorious for the amount of releases they have and it can be overwhelming at times. So. That is part of their business strategy as well and what gives them a competitive advantage compared to competitors. And in their space, given that they're, they're more of an affordable luxury makeup line, I'm not going to call ColourPop a drugstore brand because that's not what they are. They are most definitely an internet brand. They aren't available everywhere. They have that exclusive deal with Ulta. So I think it's really important to note that they are not a drugstore brand. That said, they do rival drugstore brands. and their competitive advantage against them is that they have the, a fast turnaround time. In other words, because they have that deep root of SPATS laboratories that only seems to exclusively work with seed beauty brands. So they have this exclusive partnership, which of course is, is awesome for them. Their formulas, their everything is exclusive to their branding. One of the things that's really hard for cosmetics companies even large ones like L'Oreal, is that they have to plan a long time in advance what launches they want to do for the year and then they bid for that space and production time at the labs they use because a lot of labs are shared across multiple brands. It's not uncommon, that's very common, but where ColourPop is not common is that they have that exclusive laboratory. So that's why they're able to just mass produce all this stuff is because they can. They don't have to compete with all the L'Oreal's or even the smaller indie brands because they have the lab there. They can develop new things and mass produce it. Just to give a quick kind of overview on how backed up and how much planning goes into launches for pretty much a lot of makeup brands that have shared labs like MAC Cosmetics and all of them. A lot of L'Oreal and Estee Lauder owned brands. The turnaround time for production can be one to two years. So ColourPop beats them out in that space. So that's a huge competitive advantage for them. Very smart. And paired with their early internet um, success, this made them a really innovative company just having those two things going well for them you don't see that a lot in the cosmetics industry but they weren't able to do that alone like you or i the average person would not be able to start up a color pop and have that immense amount of success without privilege Okay, anyway, um, they would not have had the amount of success they have without that connection to SPATS because of the amount of turnaround time it is to get products developed and launched while you're also competing with your competitors for that same lab time. And they also had the capital to do that, so in other words, money. Um, they are a privately owned company so they never went public which means they're not publicly traded they didn't ask for public investments because their company is private it's really hard to know with 100% certainty that they did it on their own or if they had a third-party venture capitalist or someone help fund their 
ventures. It's really hard to say, but given their success previously, um, Lauren John Nelson, that is, given their previous history with SPATS and that being an established company, along with the wealth that comes from having a successful business and someone who, you know, works as you know, a CEO or someone in an executive level of a company, you got a little bit of money to spend. Maybe not as much as others, but they definitely had that privilege compared to, let's say, you or I, if we wanted to start an indie brand, we would probably have to find a small lab. If we didn't have a lab, we would have to make things ourselves and there's different ways you can approach it, but for the most part, if you wanted to work with a lab, you have to invest a significant amount of money up front. So you say, okay, you can choose a formula that they already have, or if you want to develop one of your own, then that costs more. Um, and then once you have the the formula you want to use and the colors, etc., then you have to like basically pre-order everything. So you have to buy a minimum, like a bulk order of, let's say, fifty thousand dollars worth of units, which means you have to sell that many units in order to recoup your costs. So that's that's why it's not an easy feat to necessarily start up a makeup brand. It takes a lot of money. Where ColourPop functions like an indie brand, it's definitely not the same because they are backed by Seed Beauty, because they're backed by this history of being in the cosmetics industry since the 50s. So they have that uniqueness about them. So Seed Beauty operates as like its own venture capitalist firm because they are an incubator brand. Um, they had Tati and KKW and, and Kylie Beauty under their brand portfolio, as well as like 4th Ray Beauty, ColourPop, and uh, soul body that what it is soul body and another thing to note is that a lot of small indie brands are their business models are a bit different as well in how they're structured for example a lot of people tend to go with like an llc structure which stand which stands for a limited liability company so an llc is limited liability for the owner. You can set it up as like a sole proprietorship where as an individual, you make all the decisions for your business, but you are shielded in some ways from having um, your personal private information being linked to that company. The sole proprietorship model within an LLC structure allows for an individual to own a business but have a separation so that if the business gets sued, the individual owners aren't necessarily liable for whatever the company is liable for. There are some exceptions to that, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna go down that legal pathway in explaining it. So you've got the sole proprietor track and then you've got kind of a corporation structure. So looking at the corporate filings under the California Secretary of state website, you can see that their LLC structure is that they have managers, which means that the owners of that LLC have assigned the management or oversight of their company to managers. So otherwise they have employees to do that for them. Either you do it or someone else does it. And they have someone else do it. They also have a registered agent that is a third party. So a registered agent is the person or the entity that's responsible for any potential legal filings or any official business that your business gets pulled into. So for example, let's say as a business you do get sued, the registered agent is the person or an entity on file that would be responsible for receiving those legal documents and be responsible for accepting service. Um, they also is kind of a way to make sure that there's a point of contact for that business regardless of what's going on because um, the owners may not be readily available. So what's interesting is that both Seed Beauty and SPATS Laboratories have the same registered agent and their registered agent is CT Corp system and they're Delaware based. Delaware is another interesting thing and I'll talk about that in a minute. Basically CT Corp Corporate Systems is a, a business service. They offer registered agent support. They offer a lot of different services for businesses. This helps take a lot of the administrative uh, boring work, as I like to call it, off the hands of a business and let them focus on an operations and making money. Things that take time, you know, filings and business licensing and all that stuff can be very cumbersome and it can be labor intensive in some ways. And it's just not something that a lot of people want to do. 
so they will hire someone to do it. And this company is just one that does that, so that's their service. Anyway, so Spats and Seed Beauty have the same registered agent. So one interesting thing that I found is that in 2020, on April 24th, 2020, there was a new filing in the California Secretary of State system for a Seed Beauty Incubator Inc. Sound familiar? Seed Beauty? It was formed in Delaware, but its primary business location is in California, in LA, in the LA area specifically. It was formed by a person named Victoria Fu. From what I could find, and it's it may or may not be correct, but doing some internet sleuthing, I found a chemist based out of New York who may be that same person. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I thought it was interesting because of the proximity to the Seed Beauty LLC. The same name, the same kind of implication on what kind of business they do, the ties to Delaware. I'm not sure what that implies. I don't know if this is just someone who decided to file the name of that business um, I don't know. I thought it was an interesting finding. I don't know if there's any merit or anything to really speculate on that, but I'm wondering if this is like a separate entity that's going to be, like if Seed Beauty LLC is going through a restructuring because their business model is changing, or maybe it's just expanding. It's hard to say. I gotta get back to doing my makeup here. I just forgot. So going back to the beginning of the year when I did my predictions for... 2021 in the beauty space I talked a lot about business so I talked about the direct competition between um, Seed Beauty and Morphe you may not think of them as being like direct competitors outside of makeup so a lot of people wondered about Jaclyn Hill cosmetics and about whether or not that was actually owned by Morphe well my hunch is that it's possible that they're using Morphe's labs as well to emulate what Seed Beauty has done with ColourPop and all of these other brands, which is interesting. It would be kind of a late start to it. But it is such a unique model. In fact, if you follow any pop culture, you might know that Cody, I don't know if it's cosmetics or beauty, but Cody is a brand that has been around for... I think it's over 100 years now because I mentioned them in another video as well with their powders. Cody acquired a 50% stake in Kylie Cosmetics. But the problem with that and the reason why Seed Beauty sued Cody is because of trade secrets. So Seed Beauty claims that Cody is trying to do some shady crap in purchasing 50% of Kylie Cosmetics because that gives them access to information with the agreements, with the labs, with the formulas, with everything relating to Kylie Cosmetics. And because Cody is a direct competitor of some of the brands that Seed Beauty owns, like the ColourPop family, for example, that puts them at an unfair advantage and it is disenfranchising them because it's stealing trade secrets. It just goes to show that ColourPop's immense success has garnered a lot of interest in the cosmetics industry where now a lot of others saw their success and want to replicate that for themselves but they're finding that it's really difficult to do that. So they're finding other ways to do it, like Cody. So it's like in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, where all of the children are approached by Oscar or Slughorn and willing to pay an obscene amount of money for the everlasting gobstopper because he wants to be able to take that and replicate it himself. When you are in business and you see a competitor doing something unique and they're doing exceptionally well and maybe your sales are falling behind, you want to know what their secret sauce is. You want to learn that. But you have to be really careful about it too. You can't just say, I'm going to copy that because there's trade dress, there's trade secrets, there's unique things that you can and can't do in business. But anyway, it just goes to show how unique ColourPop is and how innovative they are in this space when Cody, an over 100 year old company, is trying to latch on to those trade secrets and get that information.
And the reason why ColourPop has garnered a lot of attention in mainstream beauty outside of like the internet and YouTube and such is because of how much money they have made. So again, while ColourPop is a privately owned company and they don't have all of this information available publicly, Dun & Bradstreet, which is a business analytics company, they estimate that ColourPop's annual revenue tops $78 million in a year, in six years. That's amazing because if you look at the same time in 2014, NYX Cosmetics, which by then was owned by L'Oreal, was getting about $120 million per year. Now, that is a big difference. There's about a $50 million difference between what each company was ranking, raking in. In six years, ColourPop was able to achieve about two-thirds of the income that NYX Cosmetics was is raking in. And this was at the height of NYX Cosmetics. Remember the NYX Face Awards? Everything was NYX here on YouTube. It's kind of since faded away, but that's a different story. It took them over 15 years to get to $120 million of re annual revenue, whereas it has only taken ColourPop six years to reach $76 million. So that may not sound like a huge feat, but if you look at the rates and you look at trends, ColourPop would look to exceed $120 million pretty quickly in a lot less time than NYX, uh, given their financial background, their unique competitive advantage with the labs, with their products, with Seed Beauty working with different brands and helping new brands form like Tati Beauty uh, being the most recent one. Of course, we don't know what's going on with Tati Beauty. By the way, I have some speculation on what's going on there. So in, I looked up the trademark of Tati Beauty. It has been abandoned. Tati Beauty is owned by Tati Cosmetics Inc. They have obviously some contracts with Seed Beauty. We don't know what that entails because it's not a publicly traded company and they're not required to disclose things. Of course, that would also be protected under trade secret. Tati Beauty is a trademark that is now dead and abandoned. It was abandoned in April of 2020, which was about the time that Tati had uploaded her Breaking My Silence video. That's tea for another time. I thought it was interesting because like what happened there? They're still in business. They still operate. Everything is legit on that front, but the trademark is no longer there. I think my eyes are doing all right here. Sometimes when I get to talking, I make little boo-boos with my makeup and then I'm like, shoot, I should have stopped talking. So anyway, so at some point we're wondering what's next for ColourPop aside from the legal woes that they are experiencing with Cody and trying to protect their trade secrets and they probably are working with their attorneys to make sure that going forward any contracts are very clearly spelled out with ind individuals and influencers and such who want to create product lines with them that they wouldn't be allowed to share Sea Beauty's magic formula with anyone which would be really important for them to be able to maintain, obviously, their success without having other competitors come into the space replicating their exact business model and formulas, etc. So, anyway. So as we look ahead with the pandemic and all of these things that are happening in the world, cosmetics are not the most important thing when you have, you know, no job, right? But it will be interesting to see what happens. ColourPop is not immune to brand controversies, as many of us are probably aware. And if you're not, well, welcome to 2021. For ColourPop, they're kind of thrown under the bus because of all the releases that they do. And some of their collections are not the best quality or they're just not the most innovative palettes. They're just like the Hocus Pocus palette. Can we just say that was not exciting to me and I love Hocus Pocus. That palette didn't excite me, nor did it excite other people. So ColourPop's business model is to produce, 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 launch, 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 go to market, go to market, go to market. That's hard to say really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's their business model and that's how they've been able to succeed is because they're able to afford to do all these quick turnaround productions. That's where they thrive because they always have something new that people are always talking about and that helps their social media, that keeps their name buzzing. So even bad press can be good for them in a sense because of that old PR adage that says 
oh, any publicity is good publicity. I think ColourPop kind of operates in that same kind of MO. So anyway, so more recently, and this is the one I took the biggest note of, they released something called the Sandstone Collection. I talked a bit more about this in one of my other videos, which I'll link below. So ColourPop made it onto my naughty list for 2020, and it's because of this. They came out with this Sandstone Collection. It looked beautiful, except, hey, wait a minute. The artwork on the palette looks kind of like native art. It looks indigenous. What's going on here? So, uh, yeah, that's not cool if you're using native art. Not only are you using artwork that is inspired by native indigenous groups that are already marginalized and underrepresented in every facet of American culture, their PR team or whoever is in charge of their Twitter account posted a statement saying that they recognize that they messed up and that going forward that collection will... Um, no longer have that same packaging, that they're going to let this one run through and the new packaging will be redone. Well, let's think about ColourPop's business model for a minute. They don't keep things on the shelf for very long. There are certain palettes that once they're gone, they're gone. They don't bring them back. In fact, that's one of the reasons why people get so frustrated with ColourPop is because as soon as they launch one palette, then it's gone and something else comes in its place with the same color story, just different theme, different arrangement, whatever. So that was where I took issue with ColourPop and th that PR statement, for one, because it doesn't matter, that palette is already, you know, not going to come back. And two, they continue to profit off of that release, and they made no mention of Native peoples, they made no attempt to at least publicly talk about any charity groups that they were willing to support. They didn't offer to work with any influencers on that collection that would appropriately uh, use that Native art because in Native culture, artwork is not just, hey, look at this beautiful thing. I'm looking at things from an artistic view. In, in a lot of Native cultures, and not all but some, uh, artwork is a depiction of family stories. It is a depiction of the struggles that people endure. It is a it's a fabric of being. It's not just look at this pretty picture. So that is where it comes off as very insensitive. And for that, I've decided not to support ColourPop in my purchases any longer because they refuse to pull that collection. And for a company of their size and of their profitability and the owners being white with this privilege, it made it really difficult for me to want to continue to support them. So that being said, um, not a big fan of how ColourPop did that. But anyway, <laughs> that's the most recent controversy. I hope that going forward they will make that right and potentially not do that crap anymore. That's one thing that I think that as brands grow really quickly, they don't have all the processes in place to ensure inclusion and diversity and equity are uh, applied across all facets of their business. And I think that was just an oversight, a bad one. And then their follow-up was terrible. And they didn't own it. They didn't fix it. Not in my eyes. So it's a bummer when you see a company that you're really excited about make those kinds of decisions because you know behind the scenes there's a lot of strategy and a lot of planning. And even though I can be pretty calculated and I understand a marketing and PR move when I see it, like I know like they're not really sorry, but they're doing it because they want to save their brand image. Like, I get that. I see right through it. And I get it from that standpoint, but they didn't even do it in the right way. Like, it's not even if they actually cared. It's more like, strategically, what you did was dumb. It was dumb. It was a dumb PR move. Just pull the collection and or say, hey, the proceeds of this collection will go towards this. We want to make this right. We want to be a socially responsible company. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. So, oh, I'm not done yet. I didn't finish my makeup. I keep getting off topic here. So that's kind of where ColourPop stands on controversy. I'm not sure if there are any others. It's hard to tell. I don't pay attention to a lot of brand controversies unless it's something that I feel really strongly about, like racial equity, diversity, um, equal representation. They're not acting like racist jerks, that kind of thing. So going into the future, looking at ColourPop and some of the things that I think we might see from them. And to kind of relate it to YouTube a bit, 
I think we're going to see more influencers working to create their own brands. And I think ColourPop is looking to be at the forefront of that. Tati is a perfect example because she claimed, or at least in some of the lawsuits and the legal filings, that Seed Beauty offered her a deal too good to pass up. So I imagine that as other larger influencers here on YouTube, even on Instagram, on other platforms, that if they are looking to create their own beauty lines, that Seed Beauty will be right there saying, hey, work with us. We've got the best labs. We've got this, this, and this. But we'll see. So I think 2021 is going to be a hard year to gauge that because of the pandemic. But we'll see. I think that Seed Beauty's business model is really unique. And I feel like they're going to continue to forge forward using this unique business model in that not only are they in control of their labs and able to produce formulas and mass produce makeup at a record amount of time, but they're also looking to expand their portfolio and give that lab, that exclusive lab access to their special brands. They might not own those brands or those trademarks, but they definitely have those really strong agreements with them. So that's really cool. I think Seed Beauty is an innovator in the space. I think that a lot of the things that they've done in six years, almost seven years time is just remarkable. Um, but again, we have to give that credit to their privilege in that the founders, Laura and John Nelson, had a lot of financial and wealth privilege that allowed them to have that ability and they had those connections as well. So anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Let me know if you like this kind of nerdy talk, if you want me to do kind of a, a strategic outlook and analysis of other beauty companies or different... My cat is playing with her toy and I don't want to pause to go take it away from her because it's too cute. But anyway, let me know if you want to see more videos like this where I do that nerdy deep dive of uh, and doing a business analysis of different companies in the beauty space. I'd be happy to. I'm trying this out. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something new. Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay electric. Mwah. Bye.